up, everyone? It's Ian from the Low Country in Kowloon Walled City here. Um, this is a little weird, a little bit of a departure for me, but somebody asked me to do a playthrough of some Kowloon Walled City material, which I've never videotaped before. Obviously, I've played the songs before, but uh, not in a while. Uh, we've been in shelter in place now for almost six months, and uh, Kowloon has not played any shows, obviously. We haven't rehearsed. Or even, I don't think all been together in the same room in six months. So, uh, had to do a little refresher course on this song, which is called The Grift. It's on our album called Grievances that came out, I don't know, a few years ago. Um, one of my favorite songs that we play, one of the more up-tempo songs off of Grievances. And uh, it does have a killer bass line that actually was written in large part by Scott Evans, who is the main driving force singer and guitar player of Kowloon. I remember when he brought in the demo, Scott had a very specific idea of what he wanted the bass part to sound like. So I'm going to go through, break it down, talk about how I get my tone, um, how to play this song, or at least how I play it now. Uh, disclaimer is that it might vary pretty substantially from what's on the record. I couldn't tell you what I played on the record. I don't really know how I play it now, how I interpret it currently. So uh, I hope you enjoy this and find it helpful and uh, instructive. Anyway, let's get to it. All right, if you want to cop this tone, there are really only two ingredients, both pretty important. Um, it's not complicated, but it is particular, I guess. So number one, 1979 Washburn Vulture. This is made by the Yamaki Corporation in 79, uh, private labeled for Washburn. This is, this might have been the bass that I played on Grievances. I also have another Washburn. This is the Vulture 1, one precision bass type pickup here. I also have a Vulture 2, which has the P bass and then a Jazz pickup as well. I only ever use the P bass pickup. The Jazz is turned off. It is hooked up, but just I don't use it ever. Um, use it as a kill switch kind of. So if you don't have a Vulture 1, or Vulture 2, which is uh, likely that you do not have one. They're fairly rare. Any kind of P bass will get you in the you know vicinity, I guess. I did have a friend describe these as um, as vultures sounding like ten angry P basses all at once. So, uh, and Scott describes them as you know a P bass, but just more so. So I believe this is a old stock Demarzio um, P bass pickup that's in there. And yeah, anyway, uh, a P bass is, uh, if not essential, you know, pretty handy to have to get this burly tone. The other thing that you, I'm gonna say you absolutely have to have, that you cannot live without, is this. It is a chronographic rusty box. I'm going to unplug it on the fly. It's not, not great practice here. Uh, bear with me as I do this thing. So chronographic, I believe is a one man pedal operation. And the rusty box, I'm probably going to get this wrong, and you can tell me about it in the comments. Uh, but the rusty box is a clone of the Trainer TS-50 preamp, made famous by Steve Albini. I guess Steve uses it to track a lot of bass stuff at Electrical Audio. Um, and it is absolutely essential to get this bass tone. I experimented with a ton of distortion pedals for bass throughout my years with Kowloon and you know other stuff. Uh, and this is, you know, if I have an evil secret to my tone, this is absolutely it. It gets, it adds a ton of grit while not fundamentally changing the character of the bass. Like it doesn't suck low end, it doesn't obliterate the low end, it doesn't turn the low end into mush. It retains all the low end and just makes it disgusting as well. Um, so yeah, P bass in this pedal. You might be able to get close with other pedals. I'd be curious to hear, you know, if, if people are able to get in the vicinity with other things. But really, if you want, like, this is, this is the real deal right here. Thank you to Tronographic. I own, like, six of these because I'm so paranoid that I'm going to get caught out. Like, he's going to stop making them or I'm going to break all the existing ones that I have. So I've got backups on backups on backups just in case um, the worst happens. <laughs> The other thing you're going to need is this crazy tuning. It's drop A sharp. So a uh, four string bass, obviously, but I use a five string set of strings, the B, the E, the A, and the D, B, E, A, D. Um, but it's drop A sharp. So 
tune to C standard and then drop the top bass string to A sharp. So this is your octave. Those are both A sharp. Uh, I have no idea what the note names are of the other strings. <laughs> but yeah, it's drop A sharp. You're gonna need some fat strings and you're gonna need to tune way down to drop A sharp. All right, I think that's everything you need. Let's get into it. All right, we're all in from the top of this one, so I will just go through the verse with you. Uh, John Howell, who wrote the bulk of this song, is doing some weird intervals that he always does. He's a very strange person and guitar player. <laughs> one of the most incredible guitarists that I've ever seen in person and certainly had the opportunity to play with. He's amazing, but he writes these just extremely weird melodies and the way he fingers them is even weirder. So um, for my part, I'm just doing octaves uh, throughout most of it. So uh, it starts on the third fret and then it's all sort of in the, uh, that's, if that's A sharp and that's B, let's see, C sharp, or <laughs> C sharp minor, I guess the majority of this stuff. So I'll go through the intro slash verse part and then we'll break it down slower. Okay, here we go. So that is the bulk of the verse part. If you play in drop tuning a lot, you will recognize those as, as octaves. If you don't play in drop tuning, those are octaves. <laughs> Not this, but this in drop tuning. So I'm just going from the low C sharp to the octave against whatever John and Scott are doing on the guitars just sort of uh, filling out the low end and amusing myself with the octave up. And again, because we're playing in drop tuning, almost everything has to be on this low A sharp string because uh, these notes don't exist until I get up here. This is now have to stay down on the top string for most of the time uh, for that verse part. A couple other things that are weird about that is that we play this really slow on the record. When we play this live, I swear it's 50 to 20 BPM faster. Um, so playing it at the recorded tempo is weird for me. Also, I don't know if I did this on the record or if I've done it subsequently, but the part that I play is like really sort of sparse and staccato. I can't remember if I was doing a more active right hand part on the record. And honestly, I can't tell listening back. But what I do now uh, essentially is, um, it's like more dubby than anything else. I'm trying to leave as much space as possible for the guitars and drums to do their thing. So. don't know that I do on the record is that I alternate the descending and the ascending line at the end of those verse parts at that little turnaround. So I'll do one that's descending, which I think is how it is on the record. And then add an ascending one. Again, more just to amuse myself than anything else. Um, I think maybe on the record, like when we had written it, I hadn't figured that out yet. And so I was just doing the descending parts that went. Honestly, don't know, can't tell. Um, maybe if I listen to it slowed down or something, I could determine, you know, what the hell I'm doing there. But I have no idea, honestly. Um, it's okay if you play it faster than the record because we do too. Next up is the thing that I think would be considered a chorus in a normal song, but since it happens only once in this song, I'm not sure what it is. It feels like a bridge almost, but I think in Scott's mind when he was writing it, I think uh, he would consider this a chorus. 
One of my favorite parts, because um, I, I get a little like spotlight moment on this, so uh, le, I'll play it, play along with it, and then we'll break it down again. So that's that. That's the uh, little chorus bridge. Um, break it down for you slowly. It goes like this. Then I'm going up to the B octave on the on a normal bass would be the D string. Let me see if I can articulate that a little bit better. And then the second half. Something like that. I have no idea whether or not that's on the recording. That's how I like to play it live these days though really sort of lean into that super high octave on the B, on the B note. Um, yeah, that's that part. Moving on. I'm completely silent through there, or I guess I just hold that note until it decays. If I ever make noise during this part, Scott gives me a dirty look. Uh, this upcoming part is something that Scott wrote on the demo. I remember he was, again, very particular about the way I played it, and with good reason. Um, it needs to be articulated in a very specific way. You've got to start it up here. Uh, eighth fret on what would be the A string on a normal bass, and then slide down to the octave. So that again is uh, A sharp, B, <laughs> C sharp down to C sharp, B down to B. And then for this one, um, you don't need to slide. But it's critical that when you start this part, you're sliding down. That's where the whole like queasiness of the part comes from. Um, so I will play along with that at tempo, and then we'll go back and we'll do it slow, and I can walk you through the whole thing. Just wanted to point that out before we even got started. goes through a couple more times with vocals. So those octave slides again are, gosh, what note did we decide that was? C sharp. <laughs> next thing was a little accent that John started doing I think at one point in rehearsal and I kind of doubled him on it or maybe I wrote it and then he started playing it no I think he wrote it and then I I started playing it along with him so uh, I'll do a whole one and we'll focus on the little turnaround thing at the end Get 
that. And then the second half. Open. Uh, G sharp, A sharp. So there's a lot going on there. Um, essentially all there is for the rest of the song but let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and play it on out So that's that. That's how you play the bass part of The Grift off of Calvin Wall City's Grievances LP. Record's out. You can still buy it. You can still listen to it. Um, this is the first time I've done like a lesson type playthrough where it's not just me playing. It's me talking and playing and walking you through stuff. So if there's anything I could be doing better, please don't hesitate to let me know. If there's anything that was unclear on the lesson, please let me know. You don't need to tell me that I talk too fast. I already know that. But you can um, leave any kind of comment and you will get a response. I look at all the comments. Um, I'm not a superstar yet, so <laughs> the comments are very manageable. I will put, the, put it that way. Uh, okay, I guess all that's left is to go through the entire hi-fi version of the playthrough, which will come up right now. Please like and subscribe. Uh, I'm trying to get like enough subscribers so that I can actually generate ad revenue and stuff from this. and. Uh, maybe supplement my income while the live music industry is on ice for the foreseeable future. So tell a friend if you liked it. Um, and if you didn't like it, tell me and I'll see if I can't do it better next time. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch and to listen. Uh, take care of each other and be well.